you. Welcome, Venerable. Glad to see you. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. And um, I'm glad that people were interested in the topic and wanted more follow up and to go even more deeply with it. So welcome, folks. And um, we'll just use the refuge in Bodhicitta prayer to set our motivation and connect. So just taking a minute, getting your posture settled, feeling grounded in your space. And try to consciously let go of any thing that was distracting you before you got to this place in time. Decide that you can come back to any of that later if you need to, but choosing to be here now. And refuge in Bodhicitta. O Sangye Chodon Sogi Chunam La, Danju Padu Dani Kapsuchi, Dagi Chunyan Gipe Sonam Ki, Rola Penchia Sangye Drupa Show, Sangye Chodon Sogi Chunam La. Janchu padu dani kapsuchi, dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki, rola penche sangge drupa sho, sangge chudon sogi chunam la, janchu padu dani kapsuchi, dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki, and allowing the motivation to connect with your heart. Thinking that we are listening to these teachings in order to develop our fullest potential for the benefit of all sentient beings. And all sentient beings includes ourselves and working for our potential includes today, but consciously making a more deep and vast motivation, feeling held by your refuge. and relaxing your attention. All right, so um, I think a lot of you or most of you were here the last time we had this conversation. So a lot of the um, run through of the review, I think we can do collaboratively and just make sure we're on the same page. So if uh, you were to think to yourself, in the world, what is the difference between love and attachment? And in Buddhism, what's the difference between love and attachment? Just intellectually, conceptually, letting yourself make it a little bit concrete, even though life's not so concrete. Just take a minute and try and remember what we talked about last time or things that you know from your own study. What's the difference between love and attachment? Colloquially and in the Buddhist tradition. And as things start to uh, bubble up, and as you start to remember, um, go ahead and share. It doesn't have to be in perfect Buddhist definition style. Okay, Buddhist. Love is um, wishing an, another person or sentient being happiness. 
Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And attachment. In the world I was, I I was raised. It it had a good connotation that you know you were attached to to somebody or something, and it, it seemed like a a positive thing uh, until I began my Buddhism <laughs> classes. <laughs> And then I realized that, I mean, that I was taught that, you know, attachment is not really a good thing, uh, whether it's to anything, uh, physical or uh, emotional, um, that, you know, basically, um, I can't think of the word, but it's... uh, when you um, give like an example would be everybody an equal amount of respect or love, equanimity, you know, mm. that, that, you know, equanimity um, is something that, you know, in love and uh, those kinds of things that are, you know, that's a, that's a good thing and something to um, work towards. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, you've got some good, good connections make happening there for sure. Uh, you know, other thoughts when when you're thinking about colloquially these terms and in Buddhism these terms before we kind of dive into even deeper, like experientially, um, in the world, is there a positive connotation to attachment that actually is valid? as opposed to uh, what we know to be the case in Buddhism, which is that the word attachment is referring to something really negative. But in the world, just kind of colloquially, when you hear the word attachment, what's the good side? (laughs) What's the bad side? The good side is when you're talking about parent-child bonding, right? Yeah. You have attachment theory and it's a healthy process that happens between a child and his mother and father. Exactly. Right. Like it's talking about the ability to make connection or feel connection in the world. Right. Not in Buddhism. That's not what the word means in Buddhism. But in the world, if you say to someone, oh, I'm giving up all attachments, it sounds like you're going into a dissociative state and you could become a psychopath. (laughs) Right. You know, so we have to remember that in the world, attachment theory has some parts that maybe could be upgraded and uplifted by Buddhist philosophy and some parts that are really genuinely wise and very important that we nourish, you know? So we don't wanna, um, I guess, do spiritual bypassing or f- get dogmatic or forget what these things were mean conversationally. Cause also then we might witness the um, worldly wisdom, you know? Cause there's a worldly wisdom about it's important for children to form and feel connections, isn't it? And if they don't, bad stuff happens, right? And the rest of their life is a lot harder. Um, So that's an important distinction. I think that we need to always remember to come back to um, whether we're in a primarily Buddhist circle of friends or whether we're in a more mixed circle of friends to remember those kind of parallel perspectives that sometimes have crossover. Yeah. Yeah, other thoughts? What's, What's the negative side of attachment colloquially in the world that you see? Things that pop psychology might say are very important, but as Buddhist practitioners, we actually see to be problematic. What does the world say that you need, but you don't actually need? The world uh, says that uh, you'll be happy if you get these things. Exactly. False advertising. Yeah. False advertising of what, right? Everything. False advertising of relationships, of jobs, of situations and circumstance. And yet we can't completely let go of our ambition and goals towards that because there's an element of truth. You know, we know that relationships don't give us happiness from their own side, but they're a regular condition for happiness. We know that having resources and security and stability don't give us happiness, are illusory, are changeable, and yet we need it as a condition, especially at our level, or our quality of life would suffer a lot. But how much, 
you know, how much of a condition do we need it to be? And how much power can we take back and remember that experiences of happiness and suffering come from the mind? So it, it's, it's this really important thing where we remember the gradual process of awakening. It's not an abrupt knowing just when you get something intellectually. You know, you can think, oh, advertising so nonsense and you're waiting in the line at the grocery store and you see the covers of the magazine saying you need to look this way and have these things and develop in this way and then you will be happy. You know, these are the ingredients for happiness. Get those ingredients, put them in your shopping cart, you know, <laughs> just like people and carrots and whatever, you know, just pile it all in there. If you get all of the ingredients correctly, you will have the happiness. And you know that that is sometimes true, which is why it's hard to completely get rid of the notion. If it never worked, we're not stupid. We're, we wouldn't keep hitting our head against the wall. But we know that it's not as true as it seems or it says, and yet there's still the promise. There's, there's the hope of kind of that one moment in time where things came together and it seemed like circumstance or people gave you a very pleasant experience. And so then you're chasing those ingredients ever after, trying to make it happen again or make it happen longer with varying degrees of success, right? So it's, it's just important to kind of sit with that, right? And so I'll just, I'll bring that PowerPoint back up onto the screen so you can um, just kind of get it tidy in your mind. All right, so the English definition, right? Love, deep affection sometimes romantic, sometimes not, it also can mean a great interest in a person, activity, or object. Attachment, colloquially not even talking about attachment theory or attachment parenting, usually has a connotation of like fondness or a sympathy for something. So colloquially, they start to blur and sound very similar which is why we have to remember that we were brought up thinking that that's what these two mean. And in order to kind of upgrade our understanding and our experience of them, we need to be very specific about what Buddhism is talking about when it uses these same words. So um, a very common description, this one's from Ego Attachment and Liberation by Lama Yeshe, but you'll feel, find a similar description all over the place in Buddhism. Love is the sincere wish that others be happy and the feeling that their happiness is more important than one's own, opposite in nature from attachment. And then attachment is a deluded mind that sees its object as attractive and sinks into and cannot separate from it and is one of the six principal delusions. So, you know, there, there's a huge difference then when you're talking Buddhist terminology. then experientially, when it's genuine love from a Buddhist perspective, you're seeing the good qualities or the positive possibilities of a person as well as their suffering and the negative behaviors that may flow from that person or flow from their suffering. And it doesn't attribute substantial causation to conditions. It realizes that if a person is in front of you and you are happy, it's not the person that like injected you with happiness. They are not the happiness giver substantially as the main thing. They're a condition, not a cause. And then attachment sees the good qualities or positive possibilities of a person, object or situation in isolation from the big picture and exaggerates their impact on your personal happiness. So if you were to make it really simple, you could say love is accurate, attachment is inaccurate. Rather than like good and bad, one's in alignment with reality, one's out of sync with reality. And this can kind of help us take away the value judgment in terms of like moralistic ideas of I am therefore a good person or therefore a bad person because of how much love and attachment I have. If you just think of it as I have funny superstitions that I was grown up to believe. Yeah, throughout my life, different things reinforced a superstition 
attachments like a superstition. Like if I walk under a ladder, I'll have bad luck. Or if I break a mirror, I'll have bad luck. You know, like attachment is a superstition. It's a misconception. And so if we have it, it's not because we're bad, it's because we're confused. But we've been taught to believe something that's simply not true. But because so many people buy into it, it's really, you know, going uphill to try and detangle ourselves from all of the things that reinforce it. And so when we're trying to get over our attachment or manage our attachment, maybe is better to say, if we're trying to manage our attachment, what we don't want to do is trigger deprivation mentality. We don't want to so aggressively remove ourselves from attachment and ideas of attachment that there's a backlash and our ego thinks that we're getting rid of all of our joy. And then we have a rebellion and then we chase the things that seem to be the causes of happiness even worse than before. And this can happen sometimes, maybe you've seen in retreats where people are really serious in a retreat and they're so focused and they're such good kids, you know, like they're trying so hard to do everything. And, you know, they come to every session on time and they prostrate their little hearts out and they're just so sincere. And it's beautiful in one sense, but it's also kind of self-punishing in another sense as if they were bad before that moment and they need to repent. And that is not Buddhism, is it? That's a tangle of many other things. And so what we're wanting to do is to recognize that despite attachment being a superstition, it's gonna feel very real for a very long time. And so we need to gently unhook ourselves and gently untangle ourselves in a way that doesn't trigger a backlash and has a lot of humor and a lot of self-awareness and a lot of connection to the human condition so that when we fall off track we don't feel humiliated or embarrassed or defensive we don't feel like we're less than we just go oh whoops you know, maybe you had some old superstition that you gradually grew out of. Maybe when you were a little kid, you really thought if you stepped on a sidewalk crack, you would break your mother's back. <laughs> maybe you really thought that one, you know. So you're walking on the sidewalk and you accidentally stepped on a crack and then you were like, oh my gosh, is my mom going to be okay? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And part of you knew it was nonsense even then, but part of you were, was a little worried do you know a superstition like that? Like think of whatever. But now, you know, you're an adult and you're walking down the street and you walk over cracks and you don't even think about it. But maybe every once in a while, it kind of occurs to you and you don't walk over a crack. Even though, you know, that's totally silly and it's this total superstition and you would never tell someone that it's true, but there's still like a little tiny part of you that jumps over a crack. Do you know what I mean? This is what happens with attachment is that it doesn't matter if you know better, the habit is so strong. It's so strong. So you need to have that same kind of like inner laughter like you would if you fell into an old superstition you had as a child that you know is complete nonsense. You know, if you caught yourself jumping over a crack so as not to hurt your mother, you would kind of giggle at yourself like, oh my gosh, that is ridiculous. You know, you wouldn't think you're bad, you just think you're silly. And this kind of framework prevents you from, you know, getting into a kind of um, spiritual rebellion that can happen if you push yourself too hard, too fast. And if you push yourself too far, too fast, if you think your intellectual understanding should be at the same level as your emotional development, if you have that assumption, you're setting yourself up for disaster. Yeah, and the spiritual rebellion will happen where you decide, oh, to hell with it. You know, this is all too hard. This isn't practical. Buddhism doesn't understand humanity. This can't possibly be the case. Or, or I am a terrible person and I can't live up to this amazing ideal. So either Buddhism's to blame or you're to blame rather than it just being an issue of pacing. Is it making sense? 
it's an issue of pacing. So like any habit, it very much helps to not be in contact with things that trigger it. If you're someone who's a recovering alcoholic, you know that going into a bar is not a great idea. Even though bars aren't to blame for alcoholism, still, you know that it's a powerful condition for you as someone who's a recovering alcoholic. So maybe certain parties, maybe certain places, negative habits are more likely to arise. You know, if there's no alcohol in your house and there's friends that don't pursue that, the urge might not even arise. And that's not to say that we don't need like a little bit of a challenge in order to kind of keep our strength building and going forward. But we don't want to like go to these extremes where we're putting ourselves in the most tempting of circumstances and then expecting ourselves to live up to our high intellectual standard when emotionally we haven't caught up yet. You know, so if there's a person in your life, <laughs> right, it's usually a person, sometimes it's an object, sometimes it's a food, sometimes it's a whatever, but whatever the condition is that is your attachment demon, <laughs> you know, it's not them that's the demon, you know, attachment is like the demon. And yet, best to limit your time. Yeah. And if you can do that in a way that is very self-aware, then you're not going to be blaming the person, the situation, or the object for the response you have to it. If you are not having good self-awareness, you'll think it's their fault that you feel this way. Yeah. So that means a lot of this kind of work needs to be done in quiet moments by yourself, you know, going for a walk, having a sit in an armchair, just having a think, whatever, but quiet moments alone to reflect on the fact that when negative states of mind arise, particularly attachment, it's because you've told yourself a story. You've built superstition and it simply is not as true as you've conditioned yourself to believe. And the kindness that you offer yourself in unpacking an untrue story is something without measure. You know, what is the nicest thing you can do to yourself? Stop creating the causes for suffering. You know, we often say, what is the best form of self-care in Buddhism? Renunciation. <laughs> Renunciation is self-care in Buddhism. Not going to a spa, right? Go to a spa if you want, but don't call it self-care, call it a pause, <laughs> right? Call it a rest if you need to. And by all means, do things to rest the body and mind. But what's really kind is if you stop hurting yourself. And attachment is like a weapon you just beat yourself up with. So this is the, this is the thing that we wanna explore even more deeply. And if you start to see how attachment is at the root of so many of your everyday problems, of course, ignorance is the root of the root of the root, but in our daily life, attachment is our main problem. Because if we're needy, if we're kind of distracted, if we're unsettled, attachment is looking for something that can't be found. If we're irritable, if we're annoyed, if we're grumpy, if we're depressed, attachment didn't get what it wanted and it's disappointed and in a grump. And that's our everyday experience, right? We kind of go back and forth between kind of like needy and distracted and wanting to be stimulated and wanting to be entertained and wanting to be engaged and wanting to kind of get into that state and then being disappointed that we're not, <laughs> you know? So things are too much or not enough, or they're too much and they're not enough. And that is the daily life experience. So if we can figure out what attachment is like, we can kind of kill it in its infancy. So, um, so we talked about some techniques last time and I'll go through those briefly, but then we'll talk about some new ones. So again, experientially, here was this dichotomy and it's probably worth going through once more. So love, you can tell it's love if there's a calmness and a contentedness and like a deep satisfaction feeling. Attachment feels excited and restless 
it often feels hungry as well, like hungry for more or comparing to the last time. Love has a steadiness and a consistency that can be maintained kind of regardless of circumstance, whereas attachment is very temperamental. Love has no expectations, or we could say managed expectations, whereas attachment has many. So this is what we talked about last time is using logical analysis to cultivate love and then logical analysis to prevent attachment. So here's those two side by side. And for both of them, equanimity is really, really important. Yeah, equanimity was the key to using analysis for our benefit rather than the analysis that just operates under the influence of habit, habit driven by attachment. So when you think about equanimity, what is equanimity? <laughs> what is equanimity and why is it so important in training your logic to be kind of built with that as a foundation? Yeah, yeah, Pamela. It's seeing all beings as equally deserving of happiness, seeing all beings as suffering, um, knowing that we all want to be happy. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, not, uh, not um, as I do, favoring my children over all other beings um, and recognizing that I want to bring all beings to that level at which I um, have compassion for my children. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, well said. It's, it's a deep recognition that there's a difference between rapport and closeness, right? You can have different rapport, you can have different history, you can have different content with different sentient beings, but that shouldn't dictate how close or distant you feel to them in terms of your goodwill. You know, there's some conversations you just wouldn't have with some people and some conversations you can have very easily with others. That's rapport, right? That's not affection, but we tie them together. Like if I have an easy flow with you, then I'm also close with you. And then you are one of mine. And then also nobody else better take you. And it gets, you know, weirder and weirder. And that's how we are, right? And you could just enjoy the fact that you have rapport with some people without possessiveness, without ownership, without mine. Just be like how wonderful it is to be able to speak easily about topics of interest with you, person A. We must have done this before in previous lives. How lovely. Let's continue that. It seems mutually beneficial. But there's a little bit of space there. You know, when I speak like that, it sounds kind of maybe cold or scientific or detached in a disengaged way. And I'm talking about detached in an emotionally healthy way that's fully engaged. Maybe one way to think about it is, um, I don't know, I have, uh, I have pretty good equanimity with all cats. <laughs> okay, for example, I really don't care who the cat is. I just like a cat in my house. Yeah, but when I was little, I was very partial to a specific cat, you know, the cat that I grew up with. Socks was the best cat there had ever been. Socks was amazing. She had a very unique personality. Nothing could ever trump Socks and her amazingness. And in fact, Socks was a very cool cat. However, all cats are cool. Yeah, some of them are cuddly and some of them are not cuddly. Some of them are naughty and some of them are not, you know, or less so they're all naughty really. But you know what I mean? Like as you grow up, you start to kind of appreciate the spectrum of diversity, even though with some things, the closeness in terms of like physical closeness or duration of time spent is easier. But if you kind of get yourself into a more kind of like spiritually mature or like adult atmosphere of viewing things, it can be like this description of, oh, a kitty, yay, <laughs> you know, like, oh, a person, yay, you know, it's a person. You can have all sorts of interesting, meaningful interactions with any person. It doesn't have to be the particular person that you've banked all your energy into, you know which is not to say that that person isn't important or significant and that the loss of them might be very hard. 
so you can feel how delicate equanimity is. How do you keep this open heart, this really open heart that says, you are equal in wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. You are the same as me and not wanting suffering and wanting happiness. You are like all sentient beings. The details are different. <laughs> May you have happiness. May you be free from suffering. You stranger, you enemy, you friend. While at the same time saying, I have labels of stranger, enemy, and friend. Sometimes we think having equanimity means we no longer have labels. What we're really trying to do is to acknowledge where the labels came from and see that they're just merely labeled by the mind based on our own experiences and projection and are excessively self-referent. But you still have the labels. You're not pretending that everyone's your friend. You know, you're not becoming like unbearable and plastic and I love everyone. You know, you're like, okay, I'm working on loving everyone. <laughs> I'm working on it, you know, but there are some people that comes more easily than others, but that's not their fault. That's my lack of inner development. It's not a fault of mine. It's just an immature aspect that needs developing and can be. So no worries. Do, do you have questions or kind of... Um, debates that come up as I say those things? Equanimity thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you talk about the labels being maintained while we do the work and progress, can you talk a little bit more, Venerable, about how those labels begin to dissolve? Like, I sense very tiny, tiny, tiny bit of the label of stranger dissolving a little bit for me. Not so much... Um, what we often call enemy. Um, but I, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how those labels uh, change over time as we do this practice. It's, it's more like your relationship with the label changes. So to pretend to be labelless is, is something that could kind of make us go into a weird road if we're not careful even though, of course, as a project in our spiritual path, we're working on realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. And that's a very deep and profound practice that hopefully we're all just, you know, slowly, slowly working on and trying to figure out and trying to integrate and see the way that everything is merely labeled by the mind. But that's something that even when we realize it experientially is something that we'll only see in meditative equipoise on it. It's actually only a Buddha that sees relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously, right? So it's going to be a long time before simultaneously relative truth and ultimate truth appear to us at the same time. For us right now, what we're trying to do is navigate relative truth, which is by nature deceptive, while at the same time holding an awareness of what we know so far philosophically so that we're not so concrete. So you take your, you know, take your child or your mother or your somebody who has got that label. And what you do is you say, you know, use mother, we all have a mother, whether we've met her or not, whether she's still alive or not, think of your mother. She is your mother. If someone said, no, that's your father, you'd be like, well, okay, but I didn't know she was in transition. I mean, that's cool and everything, but I thought she was my mom, you know, but I mean, like she's your mom, right? And when you think about mother, then you can expand the label mother and think she is only mother in reference to me and maybe my siblings, you know, to her mother, she's her, she's a daughter to her sister. She's a sister to some people. She's an aunt. To some people, they don't label her relationally, et cetera, et cetera. That's a very easy analysis. But when you're a very little kid, your whole world is she is mother. You don't even know she has a name, right? Her name is mom. I remember when I was four, my mom was like, my name is Brenda. And I was like, no, it's not. It's mom, <laughs> you know, I was offended, right? But, you know, so this is the thing that we do with working with labels is, it's not like I'm gonna start not labeling her mom. It's that I realize she's only mother in relation to me. And then what does mother mean? And we all have all these huge elaborate stories about mother. 
or partner or boss or friend, right? We have a whole story about what that label is supposed to mean given our context and our history. And then we assume that the person we're labeling has agreed to that and is like signed on the line. Yes, that is what mothers do. I will sign here. And if I don't live up to it, you tell me, you take me to court, you know, like, no, nah, that never happens. But there is, that's what attachment does is it assumes that there's some sort of document that you've all agreed to. And then you're mad when they don't live up to the agreement that they actually never signed on for, you know? So, so an equanimity meditation is just kind of expanding out and expanding out that the labels only exist within a context. And so then you're grasping to what they mean and what they should do loosens. Does that make sense? Very much so. And it, it, it makes me think also about this notion that we're confronting of color blindness, you know, the fact that it's just not possible. And exactly. um, yeah, it aligns with that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and I mean, you know, equanimity ties right into the, the work that is in conversation societally about looking at, you know, racial bias and things and prejudice and things, which of course has been a, a conversation since the dawn of time, but is at least in more popular culture conversation lately. And our Buddhist understanding of equanimity can really help this conversation because we don't have to be so attached to the way we were kind of built, you know? You can think I was built, quote, built a, with a certain set of biases. And then you can acknowledge those without feeling humiliated to have them. And if you don't feel humiliated to have the, your biases, it's a lot easier to say, well, that one's stupid. That's not true. Oh man, I didn't even realize how silly that was. Chuck that out. And you can start uprooting your own racism or your own sexism or your own homophobia or transphobia or whatever it is because you're not identified with how you were built. But you, you know, you're still taking ownership and responsibility of it. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, say. Well, I wanted to do a little thought experiment with you because I loved your an analogy of the cat, using cats as a, as a class category. I don't have cats, um, so I can really, uh, you know, look at them with equal eyes. But then I was thinking if I had a cat, I know I would be biased, right? That attachment would creep in. Like somehow it just does like when it's mine, you know? Um, and then, so my thought experiment was, um, you know, the level of self-awareness and what to watch out for. Like how do, like when I do get a cat, how do I stop myself from making that cat like the most special, my cat? And just like you said, experientially have what you know the self-awareness or whatever to talk myself out of it like it's so it's still a, a, a precious cat but not that clingy yeah yeah it's important isn't it and with people even more so and with everything you know and and I think that one of the important pieces is to recognize that things that are in our life more often are going to be more triggering, <laughs> you know, the more often something is in our daily life, the more sensitized we become to it. And that's part of the reason why there can be some very kind, very nice, very accommodating people in our life who we're easily frustrated with. And then there can be like a new person that we don't really know very well, who's actually very rude, but it doesn't bother us that much. You know, it'll, it'll bother us if we keep seeing them, <laughs> right? But just the first time we're like, huh, wow, that was rude, huh? You know, but if you see someone every day who's only like a little rude, that little rudeness builds up into a how dare you, you know, or oh, you again, you know, even though relatively speaking, it's quite mild. Or if you took, you know, one moment in time out of context, it wouldn't seem that bad. Okay, so proximity is something that very easily feeds attachment but knowing that, then it doesn't have to. So it really is like the knowing that and to say, okay, there are some people in my life all the time. There are some pets in my life all the time. There are some circumstances in my life all the time. And that is the fuel of my practice. That is the heart of my practice. And if I can work on it with these relationships, the ripple effect is gonna be huge. 
So, yeah, you know, it's interesting because we make, we do make agreements once we're adults. You know, when we were kids, there was an assumption of certain agreements, like you're supposed to pay attention to me. <laughs> you know, that's the main assumption we have as children, pay attention to me. <laughs> and then as we're adults, we're like, oh, crap, that is still my assumption. How embarrassing. <laughs> Everyone wants to be respected and heard and loved. All right, let's negotiate an energetic exchange or a balance of power or some sort of communication device where things feel equal and let's talk about it. You know, as you become adults, you have to start navigating these things to facilitate equanimity in such a way that no one feels taken for granted. And sometimes people are going to uphold the agreement and sometimes they're not, but there does start to actually be agreements once you're an adult. And, you know, take a pet example because it's less triggering. By bringing a pet into your house, you're making an agreement that you will look after them. You know, there's lots of cats you might see on the street. And if you have time and energy and resources, you might feed them. But, you know, we kind of have a societal construct of once you bring it in the house, you're responsible for it. And if it hurts its foot, you take it to the vet and blah, 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 blah. That's an agreement that you're making by bringing it into the house. And that doesn't mean it's more important than all the other cats. It's just acknowledging that your radius of impact can only be so wide at your level right now. And so for this one, here's the commitment. While energetically, I hold you all in equal regard. So this is why it's easy to get overwhelmed because as soon as we start to care for something or someone, and then we think about equanimity, it's almost like we feel like we need to chase all relationships and like bring them up to the highest standard of love we have in our life. And that's overwhelming and we can't, but we can take, you know, one of the more healthy relationships, one of the more loving relationships in our life as kind of a blueprint for the way to expand the heart to others. And we can make that relationship even healthier and healthier. So you could use, you know, your flatmates or you could use your coworkers or your spouse or whoever's kind of in your life regularly and really work on nourishing the love in that relationship without thinking that this is the most important person. Even though it becomes the most important relationship, it's not the most important person. And it's only the most important relationship because you've chosen that, not because it was from its own side. And all of that frees up space. So then it becomes an interesting kind of explanation when we get into grief, because there is kind of love-based grief and attachment-based grief. You know, is grief an affliction? Is grief not an affliction? It's a really interesting conversation to have because the word grief isn't quite so tidy in Tibetan, you know, there's a lot of words around, you know, sadness or depression or melancholy or whatever, but just grief, experience of devastating loss of a human being who dies or leaves. Sometimes that is, when it's in the love category, what is that like? And when it's in the attachment category, what is that like? And then what's the societal blurring that makes it even harder to move through? And what are the expectations and pressures of the people around you? You know, it's a lot of the time what we feel like we should express to demonstrate how much we loved someone is actually a demonstration of attachment behavior. You know, if I really loved them, I should be falling apart right now. And if I'm not falling apart, it must mean I didn't love them. So to demonstrate, I feel grief to my friends and family, I must fall apart, go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? But grief can look a million different ways. And sometimes you have grief related to love and sometimes you have grief related to attachment and it goes in waves and it changes and the way it feels is not the same day to day. And, some, you know, maybe less evolved forms of psychology might say you will always have a hole in your heart, you will never get over it, you'll just build a life big enough to encompass it and you'll heal in that way, but you'll always have that hole in your heart. And Buddhism would say, how come? No, 
not necessary. And that doesn't mean that you didn't love them. Yeah, but societally, we're almost trained to think you have to, you know, have these annual memorials and these, you know, constant conversations about they were important and we must say that all the time or else it means we didn't care and we must also fall apart semi regularly and certain triggers should bring out certain sadness and if it doesn't I'm bad. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, you know, it's like, don't force an emotion, just feel your emotions, but you don't have to give in to the story around them or the story you think you should have because of them. So grief and love and grief and attachment are really interesting things to explore because I think that a lot of the really devastating grief is attachment, not getting what it wanted. Just like anger, is attachment not getting what it wanted. Just like depression is attachment not getting what it wanted. When attachment doesn't get what it wants, it rages. So if you can go back a few steps and see the way that what attachment wants isn't possible and is shrinking your mental experience to something way too concrete and finite, then the other ripple effects don't happen as often. You know, so you wouldn't say to yourself, stop having grief. No, that's aggressive. It's unkind. It's not logical. It doesn't work. But if you can kind of rob it of its food, it might gently settle. So, you know, one thing that can happen is that if we have grief related to someone leaving or dying, there can be this sense of all of the things I planned and hoped can't happen now you know we can't finish that conversation we can't reconcile that drama we can't cathart that emotion all those possibilities are now ended for this relationship and i am devastated by that yeah there's that feeling and that that devastated by that which is normal which is human which deserves love is an attachment response because obviously those things weren't possible. Yeah, they just, they, they didn't happen because they couldn't happen. And grief is so delicate because you want to nourish that soft open heart that can come with grief and allow that to kind of, you know, in a way, kindly humble you. That sort of beautiful kind of modesty and sensitivity that can happen when you have grief but not then bring in all of the extra layers. <laughs> so a broken heart isn't the worst thing on earth, but a broken heart with a big story is. Is it, is it making sense? Yeah, so, you know, so a grief that is just, I lost someone that I love and someone that I love is who was beneficial in my life. I was beneficial to theirs. They were beneficial to many sentient beings and now they're gone. And that is poignant. And I recognize that loss. That's fine, right? Like that's fine. And that's beautiful to sit with and just how wonderful it is that I knew them. How wonderful it is that I knew them. The best way to repay their kindness is to learn the lessons I learned from them deeply and share them, isn't it? And, you know, the best way to honor their legacy is to think about supporting the things they cared about. That's a lovely thing to do. But to think, I don't know, I have to be falling apart. Otherwise, I didn't care. That's, that's society. That's not truth. But yet, if you fall apart, that's normal. You see what I mean? Like, we were built to do that, and so it's natural that we would. But we often feel like our responses are the inevitable response, the response that has to happen. Even if you saw a documentary on the million ways different cultures express grief, still you feel like your expression of grief is somehow the inevitable one and the one that has to happen. 
but for some cultures there's a quietness for some cultures there's a noisiness for some there's lots of prayers in a temple some there's prayers in the house for the you know that it looks different in every culture and yet you know we have this kind of thing and it can be helpful to kind of put yourself through the paces of what is my cultural my, what does my culture do to celebrate a life but i don't have to buy into all the nonsense that isn't logic based and isn't helpful it can be a tricky thing because you know it's not like you're the only one who lost that person whoever you lost and there's going to be a whole myriad of responses and how to hold the space for other people's differing responses while still being kind about your own it's tricky but it's a good it's a good sort of thought process to have with yourself before the next big loss because there'll be another big loss you know however many losses we've had in our life there'll be another one so before we have the next one to sit with okay next time what really worked well <laughs> from from my memory and what didn't work well from my memory what do i want to do more of what i what do i want to do less of so so grief's a, a kind of a scary tricky thing to bring into this conversation but what is it what ideas does it bring up for you or questions i think it was really nice i've never really thought about grief like from from like love and attachment i just and both my parents have died and i i noticed the difference like when my dad died and i really hadn't uh been much exposed to buddhist philosophy and my reaction then and then when my mother died five years later and I, I actually remember consciously thinking, you know, what I have learned helped me so much. And it is really something that everyone, um, like, you know, you can't even like put it into words why my study of Buddhist philosophy helped so much, but it really did. Like it gave me, I just, part of what you said, you know, I, I love my mommy so much, but, and I miss her so much, but I just, was more grateful that she was in my life and that I learned so many things from her. And, and you know, how can I share that love? Um, but it, and I really had that moment where I thought, I am so grateful for all my teachers and all my teachings. It's made this, made this moment in my life um, so gracious. And I can also accept how other people are feeling too. Because, you know, it's an Indian family. We have our own rituals of 12 days of mourning and all this stuff. And, it's very different, but this was such a nice framework, Venerable. Thank you so much. I really will listen to this part of the talk again so it sinks in. Good, yeah, yeah. Look, it can be a little confronting, you know, because sometimes we've responded, you know, to loss in unhealthy ways, I'm sure, you know, even if it's just loss of a job or loss of a pet or loss of a partner or loss of something like that or a death, you know, there. I'm sure there are times in our life that, you know, grief looked like grumpiness <laughs> or grief looked like irritability or, you know, wanting to withdraw or grief looked like hyperactivity and logistics and busyness and getting things done and checking on people and giving excessive casseroles or something, you know, like grief looks all sorts of different ways. And sometimes it's healthy and sometimes it's not healthy. But if we have a little bit of kind of objectivity to notice it, we can let our feelings feel without believing all the things we assume those feelings mean. Yeah, because we, we have to remember where feelings come from. Yeah, f feeling just mental, physical, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Feeling comes from past karma. Intention creates new karma. So what's happening in this moment is not from this moment. This moment is a condition for past moments to ripen into an experience physically and mentally. So that could be why in some rooms in the house, you feel differently, right? It's not the different rooms that made you feel that way. It's the associations you have with them and the way in which you've made them a condition for past things to ripen. Similarly relationships, similarly blah, blah, blah. So if you're having a big wave of some very uncomfortable emotion, the, the advice again and again in Buddhism, regardless of the negative emotion or the uncomfortable emotion is don't suppress it, don't feed it. 
Don't squash it. Don't believe it. Just let it roll through. You don't have to call it truth or lies. A feeling is just a feeling. There's a lot more going on in your mind than feeling. Feeling is a very dominant portion of our experience and we don't want to pretend that they're not happening. And sometimes we need to kind of adjust the choices in the day based on the feelings that we're having. But that's different than kind of giving in to believing that they're the whole story of truth of this moment because they never are and they never have been. Yeah, even basic psychology would agree that what we're experiencing and thinking right now is the result of conditioning. We would say conditioning plus karma or karma is conditioning. You know, so it's, it's a delicate thing to feel what you're feeling without needing to make sense of it all the time. It's useful to make sense of certain patterns. It definitely is. But there can be a danger in thinking you can get to the root of the issue. Because as soon as you get to the root of the issue, you start opening up a cavern of a whole nother set of things to get to. And you could, you know, spend your whole life navel gazing, trying to understand why am I like this? Why am I like this? Why do I do this? Because of ignorance, <laughs> that's always going to be the answer, right? And then because of ignorance, you have attachment and sometimes it's fulfilled and sometimes it isn't, etc. <laughs> you know, so, so it can really free up a lot of mental space if you stop needing to figure out every single reason why. While at the same time, checking out some reasons why. Yeah, so I, I say that because in, in Western culture, particularly, especially therapy culture, there is this kind of feeling like if you can just get to the bottom of it, there'll be this catharsis and this release. And sometimes there is for a moment and then just a whole nother set of things and then ancestral things and then cultural things. And then, you know, it's like, why? Yeah. Um, and yet to know that you have certain biases or certain prejudices because your family has certain belief systems, useful. Because <laughs> then you go, oh, that's why I think that way. Well, I suppose that made sense given their context, even though it was silly then, I get why they thought that, but enough, <laughs> you know, enough. From here forward, we shan't do that in our family. One thing I will share is yeah. uh, sometimes uh, in reference to love relationship where uh, you know someone is, it's not right for you. You know the relationship is not right. But if like, let's say a breakup happened and then you, it's interesting how you said about uh, uh, with attachment because you are grieving with attachment. It's not because you are aware that the person is not good. You are aware that the relationship will not survive. And, and, but something in you still wants to make it happen. Uh, and then you are grieving the, sometimes like even for me lately, I'm asking myself, I'm like, but why, how come sometimes we get so sad? And, and I'm realizing it's not, the actual person that we want back or is it's the the routine that you had with this person and I think even when someone died when you lose a loved one it's just the routine the the the, the things that you used to do with the person the things that you used to experience I think that's the things that we crave or her desire want back so I feel like the, uh, when you were explaining grieving and attachment for me, I feel like this is what kind of really, really touched my heart. That is just like, yeah, we really don't want the person back. It's just <laughs> the, we attach to the things that we used to do with this person. What, yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. Thank you so much for putting it this way. It makes so much sense. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And it's a good point that you're making. Yeah, it's the routine sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes it's um, 
the routine plus an assumption that you can only have the experiences you had in those routines and the comfort you had in those routines with specific person A, <laughs> you know, when um, it's confronting, but actually you could have that same kind of condition with many, many different people. And the idea of, you know, like a soulmate or something is not true. <laughs> Right. With enough uh, mutual respect, with enough genuine affection, you could probably make it work with most people. <laughs> right. And that's kind of embarrassing if you're like, I found the one, you know, it's like you found a one. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> you know? But yeah. Yeah, we can know better and still it hurts, you know, and that's the thing is when we're on the spiritual path, I think we sometimes think like it shouldn't hurt if we know better. It's still going to hurt. Beginningless time of this habit, how could it not hurt to lose something we expected would fulfill some sort of need? Of course it will. But the more we think about it on purpose, the less power it has. You know, and many teachers would say and explain the, the term meditation means to familiarize. But, you know, meditation is not the only form of familiarization. It's just thinking about what you know on purpose again and again so you don't lose the lesson and you don't fall into the old trap and that can be the tricky thing for us why should i think about it again if i already know well we forgot right we're too distracted in the moment and then old habits kick in rather than the new knowledge which we do genuinely have which is very powerful and does kick in sometimes still we have to reinforce it for it to be the way we think now you know, and then these separations don't hurt so much. Yeah. So I thought we'd do a meditation, but would you like um, like a five minute break before we do meditation? Yep. Okay. Let's have five minute break and then we'll come back and sit. <laughs> 